I thought for once I'd talk about my own science, yeah, which I don't usually do. I usually talk about more general things in science, but I talk about some of the research that I've been doing, or actually perhaps more correctly, some of the research that mostly Tom Pitkin, who's my PhD student, has been doing. Time slicing. Time slicing spiral galaxies with SDSS4 manga. What does that mean? Where do we start to tell the story? We probably need to back up a bit and talk a little bit about galaxies. So here's a couple of galaxies, a couple of nice spiral galaxies. And we can come back to talk a little bit about what the hexagons mean, but for the moment, just look at the pictures of the galaxies. Probably the most telling difference between these two pictures is that one of them is blue and the other isn't. Stars of different masses have different colors. The most massive stars tend to be blue, and then the less massive stars tend to be red. So whenever you see blue light, that tells you there are massive stars there, which means that the stars must have formed recently. A blue color tells you that a galaxy is actively forming stars, and a red color tends to tell you that it probably isn't so actively forming stars. What slightly complicates the story is that there are other things that can make galaxies blue or red as well. So for example, if a galaxy appears red, it could be that it's intrinsically blue, but there's a whole load of this dusty material between you and the galaxy, and dust tends to absorb the blue light but let the red light through, so you just end up just seeing the red light. So it could be a dusty galaxy. The other possibility is it could be a galaxy that has a lot of heavy elements in it, in that heavy elements absorb light at different parts of the spectrum, and they tend to be better at absorbing blue light than they are at absorbing red light. So therefore you end up absorbing a bunch of the, of the blue light that would have been emitted, but you still see the red light. Fortunately, you can do a bit better than just looking at the colors. And in particular, you can split the whole thing up into the complete spectrum, so the, all the colors of the rainbow, and study in detail what the light is at different wavelengths. Here's an example of what happens when you do that. And this is looking at different stellar populations and there are different things in here that there are different ages of stellar populations and there are different amounts of heavy elements. But the only things really to take away from this is, so this is basically how much light there is as a function of wavelength starting at the blue end of the spectrum and ending up at the red end of the spectrum. So this is the intensity of light, it's kind of a continuum. And then there is these little dips at very specific wavelengths. And these dips are where some particular chemical element is absorbing starlight. So this whole very kind of regular series of lines here, for example, are all due to hydrogen. And as I say, these different lines are for different assumed ages and different assumed heavy element abundances. And they're all different, so you can actually sort of disentangle all these different effects. So if you were to, to take the spectrum of a galaxy, you could actually use this kind of information to tell what, why the galaxy was red, why it was blue, and sort of distinguish between these different effects. One of the games we can now play are with things called integral field units, or IFUs, where instead of taking one spectrum at a time, you take a whole bunch of spectra from all across the face of a galaxy. So we can do this kind of across an entire galaxy all in one go. And so actually this hexagon on these pictures are sort of the footprint of the area where we've actually been playing this game. And the reason why it's a hexagon is because the way that this is actually done in practice for this particular survey is that there's a whole bunch of optical fibers which have been arranged in a hexagonal pattern. And each of those fibers captures a little bit of light and gets fed into a spectrograph and the spectrograph records the spectrum. So essentially we can kind of record the spectrum at every point across the entire face of the galaxy. And so this is actually a survey, it's this thing called Manga. It's a project I've been involved in for a number of years now. And there's hundreds of astronomers involved in it. It's part of an even bigger project called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The Manga project is doing this, essentially this, of recording spectra all across the face of the galaxy for 10,000 galaxies. So that's one part of the thing that's new, that we can actually do this kind of analysis across entire galaxies at a time. The other bit that's new, and the bit that my PhD student Tom's been working on, is that what he's been able to show is that actually, you can do better than just saying, is it this or this? In that this assumes that, the you know, that all the stars of the galaxy are one age, right? They're all 10 billion years old or they're all a billion years old. Of course, in a real galaxy, that's not what happens. In a real galaxy, there's some stars which are young, some stars which are middle-aged, some stars which are old. And of course, the light you get from them will just be the sum of all those different spectra. What he's been able to show is you can kind of disentangle it, which means that you can take a spectrum and say, ah, this bit of the galaxy is 30% old stars, 60% middle-aged stars, uh, and the remaining 10% is young stars or something like that. So you can actually disentangle all these different things. And that's this thing called time slicing, that essentially we take the whole galaxy and say, okay, so 10% of the light is young, this amount is middle-aged and so on. We can actually go through the entire life history of the galaxy and kind of split it up into its parts. So this actually is, for this galaxy, one of those galaxies I showed you before, this actually is this galaxy. It has a very uninspiring name. In uh, the parlance of this survey, it's 8329 minus 12701. Oh, it needs a name. What's your student's name again? Tom Peterkin. Peterkin's Galaxy. Peterkin's Galaxy. There you go. That's better. So here we are going through and slicing through the galaxy from the oldest stars to the youngest stars. So we start with the oldest stars here. In the middle. And then we go through 
middle-aged stars, youngest stars. So the first thing is to form a right in the middle, very centrally concentrated. Over time, it grew outwards, formed this disc around it, and then the latest stars we're seeing now are forming in the spiral arms. That's where new stars happen at spiral arm. Exactly. So it's actually telling you this is where star formation is happening now, because actually that's the strong, most intense star formation happens in the spiral arms. The other interesting piece of information is, remember I said not only do you get the ages of the stars, but you get to learn about what their heavy element abundances are as well. And the slightly sort of counterintuitive thing is the color coding here is basically telling you what the heavy element abundances are in that the reddest colors are the highest heavy element abundance and the bluest colors are the lowest heavy element abundances. And so what you can actually see is that those first stars to form is quite red. And so they have a lot of heavy elements in them. Now that doesn't seem to make much sense because remember I said that the way you get the heavy elements is by having successive generations of stars. And yet you'd have thought the first thick stars to form, there can't have been successive generations of stars to make that happen. What this is telling you is that in that inner region, there must have been a very quick turnaround of making lots and lots of stars and many generations of stars very quickly to kind of crank up that heavy element abundance. And then as the thing grew outwards, you're making more and more stars out of more and more kind of pristine material that's falling into the galaxy that hasn't been through so many generations of stars. So that, I guess, probably is not something you would have sort of assumed if you hadn't actually seen the picture here. You might have assumed that the stuff in the middle should have the lowest heavy element abundance, whereas actually this is telling you that the story is a bit more complicated than that, and actually there must have been lots of generations of stars in the middle. And it's telling you that the stars are being made from new material coming from outside, not what's been spat out by the old dead guys. For the most part, although it doesn't have zero chemical and heavy element abundances, so it's, it's sort of telling you that there must have been some processing within the, the disk, but actually it's more pristine, it's, 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 it's more kind of new gas falling in that's making the, those outer parts of the galaxy. The technical aspects of doing this is quite difficult in that you've got somehow you, this, this aspect of it, of disentangling all those different components to figure out uniquely what the thing was made of, is actually really quite technically challenging and complicated. So a lot of the process has been going through a lot of testing to say, you know, if we make a, make a galaxy ourselves where we know what the components are and then we kind of sort of pretend to observe it and add a bit of noise as we would actually get in a real galaxy, can we then get back out what we put in in the first place? And so there's a lot of testing you need to go through in order to do this to convince yourself you really are doing this slicing things up in time rather than just randomly fitting components. If you have a jet of material coming out of the centre of a galaxy and it starts to wiggle around, that's probably this kelvin helmholtz instability as well. It's basically wherever you have two streams of material travelling at different speeds, this uh, instability will kick in.